So this will be the last example from chapter five, and then we will proceed to look at transition metal complexes in chapter 10. So the last example we're going to work through um, is to generate the molecular orbital diagram of uh, boron trifluoride, so BF3. And I just want to remind everybody about the approaches necessary to take when trying to construct the molecular orbitals for larger molecules, and specifically now when the outer atoms contain p orbitals. So of course, you still have to determine the point group. Um, we're way beyond the linear now, um, so we know those approximations. So let's not concern ourselves with that at the moment. Um, typically, the principal axis of rotation is still going to be the z-axis. And then now what you'll notice is if the molecules are nonlinear and the outer atoms contain p orbitals, what we're going to do is um, the y axes of the outer atoms are now going to point towards the central atom. So the y axis is actually going to represent the sigma bonding axis. And that actually gives us an internal reference um, at each atom position for x and y. Uh, so you'll see how that winds up making a lot of these problems uh, more straightforward as we work through this example. And then you're going to do everything we've normally done except now um, because we're not dealing only with sigma interactions and we have to now be concerned with uh, pi interactions that are occurring between the central atom and the outer atoms. What we have to do is you basically treat the S's together, the PX's together, the PY orbitals together, and the PZ atomic orbitals together on the outside atom. And then if the orbitals um, change position, character is zero. If they do not change, character is gonna be one. And if they remain in the same position, but change sign, it's minus one. So that is gonna be very characteristic of what happens with, with p orbitals. So you'll see lots of examples of, of how this will play out, but we're gonna start obviously with just boron uh, trifluoride. And then four, five, and six are effectively the same procedures we've gone through before. So there's really no major changes that are going to be necessary when we um, think about the rest of the approach. So let's um, actually get started on this. So in BF3, the you know, point group is D3H. So this is analogous to BH3. And because it's analogous to BH3, the 2S group orbitals of fluorine are going to look exactly the same as the 1S orbitals in hydrogen or the H3 group orbital that we constructed previously. So that's going to be really straightforward. Now, um, as a reference point, let's effectively put um, the BF bond, as you can see there, as the y-axis in this particular case. And let's, um, let's see what happens here if you do that. So when you, let me clear the pen markings because this is very important to illustrate. So what's going to happen in all cases is if you notice the y axis and positive y is being forced to point towards the boron in every single case. And that's also going to be representative of the py orbitals on each of the fluorine atoms. And then as you can see, because we, we chose that as our, as our direction, X and Y, or sorry, X and Z are always now going to be in register with Y as you undergo all the operations in the point group. So that's going to be really critical, but the way that it can be illustrated is just shown here, is that if you notice, the three PY orbitals in this particular case are all pointing right at um, the boron atom, and then you can kind of see if you do a C3 rotation, see how the PY orbital interchanges from the, fir from the first atom to the second, but it's actually moving position, but you notice that its orientation with the fact that it's pointing along the bonding axis is actually staying conserved as a function of that rotation. And you'll see the same things happening with the X orbitals as well. See how they 
all sort of stay in register, but their orientations are with respect to the boron fluorine um, sigma bond. Anyway, to keep, um, keep on this, um, I'm leaving a bunch of this for homework just because it takes forever to go through um, each of the details here, but I'm gonna give you all the answers. So when you make your reducible representations for the outer atoms, um, so the fluorine uh, 2s orbital, so this is for F 2s, it's exactly the same as the, as the hydrogen 1s was when we did uh, borane. So you'll see you get that representation and then you, you treat PZ separately, PX separately, and the, and the three PY separately and effectively that's now giving you um, the orientations, or sorry, the, uh, the, the reducible representations for each of those orbital sets. And what's actually being used in all, in all four cases are these objects that are just shown here for all four cases. And then be sure that you can generate those representations. Then if you do tabular reduction, each of these now gives you the uh, symmetries of each of the respective group orbitals. And now, as you can tell, there's eight of them. Um, and then four of them are doubly degenerate. So you can kind of see where this would come from. If you add those up, there should be 12. So um, there's one there, two there, one there, two there, one there, two there, one there, two there. And you can kind of see that that's going to be two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So it gives you back exactly the representation that you started with. So those are the answers for the symmetries of those orbitals. And, and honestly, this is more than enough to construct a molecular orbital energetic diagram, which is what we're interested in most of the time but you can actually invoke projection operators in each of these cases to visualize what all these orbitals are gonna look like. So if you go through and do that entire process, this is what every one of these orbitals is gonna look like. So from the 2S uh, group, you'll see that this is incredibly familiar once again. So that's not much of a surprise. And then the rest of them are, are all new, but what you can kind of get from this is notice that the phasing patterns um, between S and, and PY have kind of a lot of similar aspects to them. And then the boron orbitals are shown here. So these are the boron atomic orbitals. So in the end, what do you have to do? Well, we have to worry again about symmetry matches and energy matches in order to construct this energy level diagram. And there's a lot of orbitals here. So this is about the extremist example we're gonna have of trying to do this by hand. But let's do it anyway. So there are the A1 symmetry matches, or sorry, A1 prime symmetry matches. There's the A2 double prime symmetry matches. And then of course, there's multiple E prime X and Y symmetry matches. And then of course you can see very clearly there's three um, that have no symmetry match. So that normally helps you simplify the problem. When we consider energetics and a few other things, that's gonna simplify this problem a little more. Um, so let's move on to, to that idea. So the first thing is, is obviously the boron atomic orbitals are, are sitting here. They're well energetically matched to the fluorine P orbitals. But the good news is, is that this really massive energetic difference between the boron 2S and 2P and the fluorine 2S is actually good news for us because then it means anything derived from the 2S um, orbital set in the F3 um, group orbital is energetically inaccessible. So those three E reps immediately can get thrown out and those will be um, non-bonding and will represent some of the lone pairs we're gonna find that are localized on the fluorine atoms. Okay, so let's take a closer look at, at the symmetry matches we had on the previous page. And then let's consider a few other things. So the entire 2S orbital set here, um, so starting, 
from this one, this one, and this one, recognizing that those now are energetically mismatched. So we're gonna eliminate those from contention in terms of making bonding and anti-bonding interactions. So that really only leaves the, the 2PY here. So it leaves this to interact with that A1. That'll make bonding and anti-bonding combinations. The pi interaction is simple because that's in blue. That's going to be this one and this one. That's going to give us uh, the one pi interaction in this structure. And then we sort of already know that these three are also non-bonding. So right now we've eliminated six of them. So let's see if we can eliminate anything else. So if you then look at the projections, what you'll find is there's very little overlap in the uh, E prime X, this one, and the E prime Y, this one with the boron atomic orbital. It's just um, coincidental that like the overlap there is, is actually really bad, even though there's a symmetry match. So there's much better symmetry matches or much better overlap, um, sigma overlap with the set that I just circled here. So, so these guys are the ones that are really gonna interact with, with those. So what you can now see is we've removed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of these from contention. And then what that's left um, for everything else is if you, if you sort of notice is, is that that just leaves the ones that I've circled. So in, in fact, we've got one, two, three and four interactions that are, we only have to worry about, three of them are gonna be sigma, one's gonna be pi. And then we're gonna be very happy with, with all of this. And then this one over here is one of the sigmas. Those are the other two sigmas. And then this guy here is the A2 double prime is gonna be the pi interaction. So let's get rid of all this hieroglyphics and then circle everything that is non-bonding. So everything marked in green here is effectively non-bonding in this picture, which then simplifies everything. So let's now move into the whole MO diagram of, uh, of BF3. So the boron atomic orbital structure is on the left. Then um, the, the F3 group orbitals are, are depicted on the right. Remembering immediately that these are energetically inaccessible, so those are non-bonding immediately. And then fortunate for us, um, these are the four interactions we have to worry about, and then there's only four of these interactions that we also have to be concerned with. Everything else in this picture is non-bonding. So this should simplify everything for us. So there's the, the non-bonding group right there. So all of those, remember, were derived from the 2S configuration of the fluorine atoms. Then moving on, the first sigma interaction is basically A1 prime with A1 prime, and you can see what will happen. That, that's the A1 prime. That's the A1 prime. So we're done with that sigma interaction. Then if you remember, there's an E prime sigma interaction that's going to take place with the, these and, um, and one of these E primes. Um, that's shown here. So we're going to just show that again. So that's going to give us E prime bonding, um, E prime antibonding, but basically sigma, two sigma bonds, and then two sigma antibonding interactions. And then the only thing that's left here remembers the pi interaction. So that's from the PZ over here. So that's the A2 double prime with the A2 double prime over here. And that winds up giving you the pi interaction. And then fortunately for us, everything else is non-bonding. So the non-bonding contribution now is gonna be the five MOs we didn't yet actually use or the five group orbitals that we didn't use because of the fact that there's either no overlap or there's no symmetry match. So that is now the MO picture of, uh, of BF3. Now what you have to remember is each of the fluorines is, is going to contribute seven electrons each. So there's 21 electrons over here. And then the boron over here has three. So the whole picture in the middle has to have 24 electrons. So when you actually fill in all of these electrons, um, this is what you're going to wind up with. 
So if you count all the way up, there's eight lone pairs on fluorine. So those are all the non-bonding interactions. So that's, that's three of the lone pairs. There's the other five. And then we basically have three sigma bonds that are these, that one, and that one. And then we have a pi bond, which is going to be that one. And that is the whole picture. And then what does this tell you? It effectively has three sigma bonds, one pi bond, and then you have to have eight lone pairs. So you see there's the eight lone pairs that are localized on fluorine. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight on there. And then there's the three sigma bonds. There's one, two, and three. And then there's a pi bond in there as well. And that will complete the entire picture of BF3. And I hope that that was very clear and will help you um, in all your future endeavors when trying to develop molecular orbital schemes. And it's been a pleasure. And I will see you next time.